Welcome back to the Everyday Night. I'm Joe. And I'm Jeff. And uh, Jeff, we have a timely subject to discuss. Ooh, I love it when we're topical. We are we are topical. Um like a like a salve or an ointment. Yes. Well, I'd rather be <laughs> I'd rather be tropical, but if you don't tropical? Use, <laughs> tropical, but if you don't use sunscreen, you need a topical. Right, exactly. Right. So it's a, the, the circle of life. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't start singing from the Lion King now. So Okay. Okay. Darn it. Yeah. I figured I could fill five minutes. <laughs> yeah, we'll lose our audience. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, that, that's hurtful. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Um so okay. what we what we are going to talk about tonight are the strikes and unions so particularly the writers guild of america sag after it's the screen Afters actors guild and the american federation of television radio artists sag after and the impending um ups strike which is they've gone back to the bargaining table to try to avert a strike and my own union which is uh i'm a member of the uh American Federation of Teachers. Uh, my own union is in negotiations right now. And um, as I was telling you before, another university I taught at, uh, um, our union was, we were represented by the steel workers. So I can say I, I, I was- I find that absolutely I fantastic. was a steel worker, yeah. <laughs> well, it was, it was near Pittsburgh, so uh, it made sense in that way. But uh, they were a strong <laughs> union. And they offered. Well, that's interesting, but I wonder how, I mean, if the steel workers had gone on strike, would all the teachers have walked out too? Um, or vice versa? I well, mean, I think one of the things, and it's one of the things we should talk about, is not crossing picket lines. And um, okay. so my, my current union, we did um, strike, and it, lasted for um less than a week so um so anyway i wanted to i i thought it was useful to talk about it because when we're talking about things related to the virtues it relates to justice and truthfulness and um uh, a lot of of issues and um <clears throat> and i i worked with someone once long time ago who likened being an employee to being in a feudal situation that uh, you owed yes. complete allegiance to your employer as if you were um, a serf or a, a tenant for a, a feudal lord and um, and it's just what they wanted you to believe. Right. And he thought it was disloyal to even look for another job. Whereas I've told my students, never stop looking for your next job. Um, my grandfather told me when I was entering the workforce as a young man that you should always be looking for your next job. The first yeah. time, the, the, the first day you're hired for a job, you should be looking for a better job. Yes. Ideally, that better job will be at your comp at the company you're already at. But, but the, I think I think the thing that my coworker then was missing is that feudalism was a two way contract. And yes. the we discussed it, this before. it used to be that employers had a loyalty. They expected loyalty from their employees, but they gave loyalty too. They provided of stability that's no longer true that hasn't and, been true and, for a long time and pensions and yes yes yeah that sort of thing yes you're you're absolutely right so uh, so it relates to the issue of unions and strikes and and that relates to a lot of things i think one of the first questions though is how are you fortifying yourself this evening for this uh topical discussion well, my 
my uh, internally apl applied uh, medicine for this evening is a yes. it's a Nelson Brothers blended straight bourbon whiskey made in Tennessee, and it's a it's a very nice kind of a middle shelf. It's 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 got um, very good flavor. I wouldn't say that it's a particularly distinctive character. It's a it's a bourbon, and um, I'm mixing it as is my wont with uh, the the ever popular favor tree ginger beer. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Oh, and a little a little Angostura bitters just to because I had this last week. I had this last session as well. So yeah, that's good. I would I would recommend trying orange bitters with that. Okay. I will I will take your recommendation next yeah. time. And okay. and you, my friend, what are oh, you imbibing this evening? I have you say you oh, as if I <laughs> oh, oh that's right, I am drinking something. Yes. I have <laughs> my uh, I have very small piece. glass of orange juice. I it, well it looks like that. It's a sidecar. Oh, all uh, right. This is a sidecar uh first appeared in Harry Macalone's nineteen twenty two uh cocktail book and um <clears throat> so named the, the the reason it got its name is uh there are a couple explanations one is that it was created for uh, a patron who always arrived in the sidecar of a motorcycle but a more, 1922 yeah but an, um, another um, i think a more likely explanation is that the recipe that they mixed in those days was had a little left over in the shaker when they poured the drink and they served that and that what was left in the shaker was known as a sidecar all right so like, but like getting but, like getting this the steel thing right with a milkshake kind of a right exactly okay <laughs> so it's it is the original recipe was equal parts cognac an orange liqueur like cointreau and lemon juice um okay. the more current iteration of it is two parts of cognac one part each of uh orange liqueur and lemon juice shaken with ice and then strained and then finished with a lemon twist which is how i'm having it and okay. it's it's nice great summer i, I was going to say it sounds quite re quite refreshing and, on a so, warm evening so here's to you. Cheers. All right. Yes. So, so, so unions and unions. strikes. So, um, I happen to know um, a number of people who are in either or both the Writers Guild of America and SAG AFTRA. This is through research for the book I'm working on now. Met a lot of these people on in zoom and <clears throat> some in person and <clears throat> um so i'm following what they're doing and what they're talking about and <clears throat> the nature of the entertainment industry has changed the last contract that they had was is set prior to streaming or just when streaming was just starting and streaming yes. was not expected to have any uh, um, it was expected to have a fraction of the audience of yes. broadcast television or at least it was sold to them that way yes. i don't think anybody with a, a little bit of reason could have seen what streaming would do well when you figure that um you remember the first internet connections you had now that goes back oh, sure. into the late 90s really and it was very slow it was not possible to stream entertainment no then. not really so that really the proliferation of streaming services is really a phenomenon of the last decade decade and a half yeah yeah um, I so <clears throat> so streaming episodes um don't pay their writers as much they don't pay residuals as much for the performers um 
And the impact that, that it's not just the people who are in front of the camera. The business, the people who are in front of the camera are a fraction of the people who work on the, on the business. Yes. Um, I've, I've asked students this at times to try to help them to understand if the, if the automakers, the area we, where we are, the automakers um, um, go on strike or have layoffs or go out of business or move to any of those scenarios, who does that affect? Well, it doesn't just affect the employees. It affects their families. And it affects all the businesses that serve them. Restaurants and dry cleaners and uh, plumbers and, and uh, everything. Car sales. It affects all of that. And it's true for, for these, these entertainment unions as well. So a lot of people are affected um, by this. But the the question for unions has always been the virtue of justice, really. <clears throat> um, contrary to the um, the myth of trickle down economics, where oh, the so called job creators are at the very top. Um, and if they do well, the money will trickle down. That's not simply not true. And it's been disproven time and time again. You well, still hear people spout that. Well, it was, it might have made sense in 1925 that if you allow companies to keep companies, not executives, companies to keep their money so that they can expand and hire more people and grow their business and they're more hire more people and that you can you can sort of make an argument like that but after the advent of automation after the advent of overseas labor none of that makes none of that makes sense anymore and has not since the 70s well and i would say that in your example in the 20s what happened is that money accrued to people at the top who then speculated on housing and other True. investments and led to that's why i said 1925 not, right. not 1930 right but it led <laughs> it led to that um <clears throat> and but you could have still made the argument in 19 what i'm saying is in 1925 right. you could have still made the argument but because union the model unions then i when you look back at what unions have done and i have a, a, a list here um <clears throat> so um uh 40 hour work week so weekends five day uh, work week hmm? five day 40 five hours yeah. work week uh overtime pay eight hour work day minimum wage uh health care dental vision bargaining breaks um yep. safety safety uh equal pay for um, all people, uh, workers' compensation, child labor laws. A lot of these were pressure by the unions and then regulations that were put in. And there are still people who want to dismantle that. And <clears throat> when, when there's a discussion about um, higher, the higher personal income tax on the wealthy going back to the rates during the 50s and 60s and people object to that same people who are referring to the owners of businesses as job creators what they're missing is that and what a lot of people miss is there were two things that were happening it was not just a higher rate of on a higher tax rate on personal income, there was a tax defer deferment if you reinvested you're right, right. Your, I mean, er, those earnings in your business. It's exactly right. what you're saying. Then you increased 
you didn't weren't taking out the wealth and going and buying a yacht, which you could give a, a vacation to a Supreme Court justice. You you were you well, now were, you can take now you can take your airplane as a tax deduction. Right. You were you were um, reinvesting in your business, increasing your business's wealth, increasing the uh, success of the business, increasing the uh, jobs. That was job creation. Right. Because of that reinvestment, because of the higher uh, income tax, that was personal income tax. Um, <clears throat> and, and corporate income tax. And in corporate particular. income tax, yes. Um, so those two things work, work together. Um, and that has been that idea, that understanding seems to have been lost. But <clears throat> what's well, happening... What's another, another aspect to this and, and a change in the economy that I've seen in, in both of us have seen in our lifetimes is the free market. And everybody wants to talk about in capitalism is the free market. The free market depends on competition. And since the 70s and 80s, certain halves of Congress have <laughs> systematically reduced the, the necessity for, for competition, right. allowing uh, companies to get larger and larger, dominate markets. Um, too big to fail. Too big, well, too big to fail and uh, so big that, I mean, there's really one company that owns the entire eyeglass market just yeah. looking at you makes me think of that there's three companies that own all virtually all of breakfast cereals when one I company owns i don't i don't know i'll i'll throw out a percentage but uh, but pepsi owns most fast food restaurants the um I used to work in advertising marketing agencies and during the nineties in particular, it started in the eighties, but during the nineties in particular. And then again, uh, there was, um, uh, consolidation, they called it mm -hmm. essentially the big got bigger. And now there are five mega agency holding companies. There are a lot of small agencies that they own but right. they own i i i forget 90 percent of yeah. the agencies right um, so they can set rates across the and, industry yeah and, and I nobody has a choice but their their business model changed too in terms of compensation how that worked there are lots of different compensation models and that's a kind of a different discussion but it's sort of related because one of the things that the entertainment unions are talking about is, <clears throat> um, and we said streaming, or did we talk right. about stream streaming? There are fewer episodes. When it started, people thought, didn't see that there were going to be, a, a, it was going to be as popular as it was, that it was going to have a viewer as large a viewership because the viewership of a particular work governed some of uh, the compensation yeah, right. for it. Um, and then another issue that is under consideration is AI because the it's, it's true. I saw an example that someone posted. He, he did a day of motion capture for, um, um, uh, I don't remember if it was a game or a movie, but then his likeness appeared in gaming, in games, multiple games thereafter, and he got no compensation for that. So At he all. got paid for his labor. He on, got paid for a day. day. A day, but not for his likeness. And um, we've, we've seen movies where they de-age somebody well or they resurrect somebody or, yeah exactly I, when when uh star wars came out with um 
Christopher Plummer alive and well in the role of Grand Moff Tarkin. No, that was um, that was um, Peter Cushing. Oh, I'm, you're right. You're, I'm sorry. You're right. Peter, Peter Cushing, Cushing. Yep. resurrected in the role as Grand yes. Moff Tarkin. The, the, it occurred to me then: at what point now does the image belong? The, the image of a character say, and and this to me is is extremely relevant with Indiana Jones, right? Yep. Harrison Ford has played Indiana Jones. He created the role. Yes. Right? How many movies? Five? I think so, yeah. Um, so I haven't seen the latest one. They de-aged him for part of that movie. Okay. He's clearly getting too old to play adventure action films. He said so. He has said as much himself, right? So could they hire an actor to do the action put indiana jones's face on him and keep making movies ad infinitum <laughs> and at some point they won't even need to hire an actor to do the action if True. the i mean they did that in the um uh star wars movie the first of the new trilogy with uh Qui-Gon Jinn and um Darth Maul for the fight sequences they had um Ray Park did his own um action in as Darth Maul but for Ewan McGregor and Liam Neeson Liam Neeson's <laughs> from, uh well, well shout and Yoda. To, shout out to to um uh Key and Peele there um <clears throat> but they they had actors do or stunt people do uh stunt performers do the action and then they digitally superimpose yep. their faces on it yeah if if um i think if the studios had their way they'd eliminate the actors they'd eliminate oh. the writers they would just call up an ai program and say um <clears throat> you know create a script for a movie based on the top grossing pictures or, of all time or here's uh, a sequel create a sequel sequel for this you've already made write a script it would it would generate a script and then it would say okay now create the images for the actors okay now create the movie and and it would do it. And they wouldn't have to pay anybody, right? Well, one of the things that people sometimes misinterpret is wh who the Luddites were, and the <laughs> Luddites were not. It's become a synonym for somebody who is anti-technology or afraid of technology, and um, that's not who they were. They were people who were who were protesting the loss of their jobs with because of um they were in the weaving industry I think, yeah industrialization because of industrialization and one of the challenges that we have faced as a society is that is that industrialization automation what do you do with craftspeople what do you do with skilled people who suddenly their skills are not needed um eventually i think something like a um a guaranteed basic income well that's that's been be, proposed by some dystopian I, authors in the i i don't think it's necessarily dystopian I, I don't either, but it's but the uh, but the stories in which this kind of thing appears are usually dystopian because, along with the universal basic income, is the complete and and utter takeover of society by corporations. The that's, corporations have replaced yeah, yeah. government. Yeah. So, yeah. that's all. Yeah. Now, I I do recall a science fiction story, wherein, um, <clears throat> all manufacturing had been automated. And it was yes. it was very much like our 
society, our economy is consumer based. So is the responsibility of citizens to consume products. Yeah. So right. as to keep the factories running, even though they were all automated. So this one guy, he was just, he was falling behind. So he, he everybody had a, um, a, a robot, a personal robot. He tasked his personal robot to start using things. So 24 hours a day, his robot would wear out clothing and, and consume stuff. And he was so successful, he got rewarded with another robot and more a greater allotment of stuff. And he kept just kept doing this. And he was afraid he was going to be found out. Eventually, he was found out. He thought he was going to suffer a ter terrible punishment. He found, no, they thought this is the solution to the problem we've been struggling with about <laughs> how to maintain our consumer-based society. We'll have robots make things and robots consume them. And... So humans are not necessary in either, in any capacity. Right, right. <laughs> and I think that the, the positive, the non-dystopian, the utopian view of that is kind of a Star Trek view where it frees people to pursue what they are interested in. Um, the dystopian yeah. view is like Terminator, where the robots say, we don't need people. So. Such as batteries. Yeah, well, yeah. well, no, <laughs> well, it's the Matrix. So, well, that's Spo the Matrix. Spoiler yeah. alert. So, so, but the the problem I see, I don't want to say problem. Here's the here's the the dystopian view of that. Even that, say, so, and this is the the Star Trek universe, right? The utopian. There's no such thing as money anymore. Everybody is everybody's needs are met. And you may pursue the thing that that brings you fulfillment and joy and satisfaction, and you are encouraged to excel at that as much as you like in all the time you have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, that will require such a paradigm shift in humanity. It's in in what we have now in the capitalist consumer um, paradigm is the only all you're doing all the only reason to become good at something is so that you can make more money and acquire more things and consume more stuff the without that incentive many people many people would do absolutely nothing i i agree that many people would do absolutely nothing but I don't think everybody would do absolutely nothing. I don't think you would. I know I certainly wouldn't. I'm not now. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm doing. I'm right. You know. I. I, I agree. That I, I think some, that. I think we already that. have some people that are not doing nothing, and some people that are having to do something to merely survive. Yes. And, and I'm not talking about. I'm not saying that's positive or negative. I'm just but I think it. I think it is guaranteed basic income, not right. You know, but but then ah, uh, but then we become how do we value? Somebody has to decide what we value so that you get rewarded better. Now, now well, what we're because, talking about there is communism. No, it's not. It's not communism. It's commun. It, if we can keep the corruption out of it, communism. There you go. I agree. <laughs> communism. I mean, I consider communism and libertarianism both to be fantasies that cannot succeed because they're they don't, philosophical extremes. Yeah, and they don't understand human nature. Agreed. Um, I, I agree. And, and so I, I don't have. I, I don't think the. I, I don't. I don't know. I heard about a place that was experimenting with a guaranteed basic income, but I'm not, I have some place in Scandinavia, like Finland I, or may, somewhere. Maybe I think I, there was also an employer who's who based on studies calculated the necessary income 
that employees would have to have as a floor to not be distracted by concerns about bills and other things. And he gave every employee that raised their salary to that. He lowered his salary mm -hmm. to do that, but he raised everybody's salary to that, to that minimum, every worker. And people said, your company is going to fail. His company is has proven since then to be extraordinarily successful because yeah. the, his employees work hard and they are loyal and they strive to do better. And that's the kind of fealty that my colleague was talking about at one point because it went two ways. Right. Uh, and ways. I think I know the person you're talking about and his, his the size of his business like tripled in yes. two years or something like that yeah. after implementing that. Um, so I, I, I think there are a lot of issues regarding... Well, one of the things you point out there yeah. is that he lowered his income so that he could provide better income for his employees. Yes. So, and that was a, a feature also before the 80s that... Yes. And I don't remember that it's like the, the top, like the owner or the primary shareholder of a company in the 30s and 40s or I, I shouldn't say that the, the chief executives right. of a of a company, the, the people who are actually there doing the work, not necessarily the owner right. of the company, but the person who was in an office doing the work, made what was it like thirty times thirty times yeah the, mo the from the entry level person right and now it's or the average five hundred times oh thousands of times yeah it's, so it's, yeah so and I think the the hope kind of is that if if the employees can somehow claw back enough of their rightful income from the corporation at some point executives will have to say well i guess i'm going to only make eight million dollars this year instead of 25 million dollars this year and that's going to have to be enough <laughs> well and and somebody pointed out in one post that the average salary of a member of was it the the i think it was sag aftra was sixty two thousand a year and actually most of them don't even make twenty six thousand. well that's the um, thing if it's but, if it's the average yeah the average is so money. skewed by right. the million dollar actors but and actresses sixty two thousand a year whereas the head of one of the studios makes seventy two thousand an hour an hour oh, an hour. oh bob Iger? is that bob Iger? yeah yeah so yeah um, shame on you yes um and then the statements that um some of these studio execs come out with um i remember hearing that uh, a team should never give the opposing team they're about to compete against um um bulletin board statements for the locker room meaning you should never say something about the opposing team before a game that's going to incentivize them oh. to come out and kick your ass you, know, right. you should never taunt them you should never do and these executives have said things about their about the union members and how unfair they are and how Oh, yeah. I mean, how unreasonable their demands are and that just fuels them it really well does. and they're trying to paint themselves as victims in a popular sphere right yeah and that's i i think the the current you mentioned the 80s and you remember the movie wall street where the one of the main characters gordon gecko yeah played by michael douglas said greed is good greed and, will save the world and <clears throat> he was sent to prison at the end of the movie but <laughs> people quoted that unironically as if it was wisdom right um that's some ayn rand level bullshit right there that well it it, it takes the again the sort of libertarian yeah. idea that if everyone 
is out for themselves and aware of their own self-interest and everyone else's self-interest that everything becomes transactional, right? Everything is me against everybody. If everybody is playing the same game, if you're, you know, if everybody's forced to play that game, the people who are, and this is another sort of fallacy, the people who are most deserving within that system will rise to the top. Yeah, and this, the, the fallacy is that everyone wants to think of themselves as the apex predator in that scenario, and you're not. And you can't be ethically an apex predator. Right. And the, the, that's not how human societies evolved to succeed. No. They evolved <laughs> to cooperate and collaborate. And they evolved altruism and support and protection. And um, I, re I remember reading an article about a an archaeological find of a pre-human fossil, a hominid, <clears throat> with a healed, broken femur. And hmm. that Margaret Mead, the renowned anthropologist, commented on this, that this indicated that that society had developed to a point where they could care for somebody who was injured until they until they um, were healed. Right. Which was okay. an extraordinary evolutionary development um, sure so well, i think it was probably i think it was probably most interesting is how early that happened yeah oh yeah yeah <clears throat> and um i i um, <clears throat> so getting back to so we've been talking about really what justice is but truthfulness Ver veritas as a virtue i think is also significant because people believe things that aren't true because it serves them their own self-interest to believe it's true well <clears throat> yeah i mean delusion self-delusion is yeah <laughs> and i think that's what we're seeing uh a lot of times too with the the heads of companies that <clears throat> um and well, i don't think i don't think they're i don't think they're deluding themselves at all i think they are absolutely cognizant of their place and position and what it takes to maintain it and they are absolutely willing to tell the lies necessary to to keep that position i don't so think there's i don't think they're deluded but I think it's, they're, de it's deception then. absolutely absolutely right. so it's dishonesty i mean you can people you can almost <clears throat> forgive delusion because it's it's almost outside of your control everybody deludes themselves one way or another in, in some way um and it's often innocent you know you delude yourself into thinking that you know when you enter the workforce that someday i'll be able to retire and have a nice life and have a big family around me that's not everybody's going to have that, but it, but we we can all delude ourselves enough to get up and go to work every day. Okay, <laughs> but yeah, I but someone who is I think consciously maintaining a deception to further their own interests is evil. Yes. Well, I think um, one way of thinking about evil is somebody who completely lacks empathy and is willing to be dishonest to further their lack of empathy for their own personal goals so it somebody who cares nothing for other people who has no empathy and no um ability to or willingness to consider other people is evil and wow there's a lot of that going around yeah. Now, going back to unions and strikes and stuff, I'm, I, I want to go back a little bit 
because I used to have a, an entirely different attitude about unions. Um, and I've always drawn a distinction between trade unions and labor unions. Could you clarify that definition? Well, a, tr a trade union is a skilled, someone who goes through a, a, a training regime, you know, a, a training regimen where you start out as a, an apprentice and you become a journeyman and you become the master and right. you, you, you learn skills and you move up and your pay gets better as you learn more skills and acquire more experience. Um, those, and I, I'm going back now to my like early teens and mm. early twenties even because I grew up in Michigan. I grew up in Southeastern Michigan where the UAW, we used to say in Michigan, if the automotive industry sneezes, the rest of the state looks for a handkerchief. Yeah. So where I grew up and my stepfather who I grew up with, um, was a member of the UAW and we were able to afford a modest home on a single income back in the sixties, you know, a family, you know, the, the, the typical nuclear family of four living in a modest suburban home of about probably 1500 square feet, car in the driveway, vacations, you know, in the summer, but not European vacations, just, you know, you could go to the lake or you could, you know, you had a, you might be able to, to timeshare a cottage with your neighbor or something, right? And he was a, he was a UAW member. He belonged to the union auto workers. That is a labor union like the, the Teamsters is a labor union. Um, it's not like the, like the IBEW, the electricians union or the plumbers union where they are skilled trades. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, I used to hear the stories that my father brought home about how they put one over on the company, how they would, they, they held people in their jobs who were absolutely incompetent, often drunk, unable to actually do their work, right? I heard those stories growing up all the time. They were absolutely common. Someone hurting themselves working on their house was driven into the factory by their friends so that they could claim that the injury happened at work and they could get compensation. Not, not, un, not an uncommon practice. Yeah, there were, there were certainly examples of that. So I think that there were abuses on either side. And then the UAW is an incredibly powerful union. Yes. So let me, let me give you a perspective. Well, well okay, let, me, go let me ahead. Continue. Yeah. I also saw now in my later teens, moving up to what would have been called a resort community um, in northern Michigan, guys who worked on that same union on you know assembly lines with barely a high school education barely got out of high school owned a separate residence a, a very you know a cabin as big as the home i grew up in snowmobiles boats you know even back in those days a twenty thousand dollar pickup truck on a on a unskilled labor job that, that anybody in two weeks could have they could have replaced them with anybody in two weeks but because of they were because of their union their pay was so high and this was in the 70s auto prices started rising to the point where you had to start taking out long-term loans to buy automobiles before that you could buy a car for two thousand dollars so, so I, that influenced my view of unions at that time, right. not understanding yeah. what they had to go through initially yeah. to establish that control. But I think that control got abused. At I some think point. it, I think it did. And I think that it, I think the automakers didn't also didn't anticipate the changing economy and increased competition 
um, because there was increased competition. I remember um, when well, the, we had the competition came from when the when the oil crisis happened in the seventies, and, and we started importing cars from Japan. And, right, and, and yeah. there was uh, a friend said that he was uh, talking with um, an auto exec who said, "I don't know why people are buying these Japanese cars." If they knew what's good for them, they'd buy our cars. Well, nobody likes your cars. And I remember I remember working on um, some uh, marketing communication materials um, back in the, for GM, back in the days of Jack Smith, I think, who all the GM cars, he, he got the bright idea to make them all single platform. So a Chevy, a Cadillac, a Pontiac, a Buick, they all built on the same platform, same body. They just changed the badging and, and a little bit of stuff. So essentially a Cadillac, was it a Cadillac Cimarron? I think it was oh a Chevy God. Cavalier. Um, yeah. And people wouldn't buy it because it, he didn't understand branding because he wasn't a car guy. And I was working on a catalog and we were using a Cadillac Alante convertible on the mm -hmm. cover, and um, wanted the, completely soulless. Wanted the <laughs> the top down on it, and I said to the because we were at a we shot at a dealership. I said, "I'm I'm not touching this thing. You lowered the top, and the dealership people lowered the top, and they broke it." I said, this is why I did not want to do it. Um, mm -hmm. But those, so I think, I think the management at the same time that, you know, when you think about what unions had to go through to get some equity in what they were doing. And then the mismanagement in some of the auto companies that it, there was the, pendulum swung in yeah uh, I agree. You know, okay. right um but i i remember i was also working on a project that was a joint auto company union annual report from some joint things that they did and i was in the room with the auto company people before the union people got there and the disrespect with which they spoke about the union employees mm -hmm. about their employees the absolute disregard they sp spoke about them with was um uh, was uh, uh, it was wrong it was appalling is that appalling the i was <laughs> appalled with several p's um <laughs> it was yeah so there was a lot uh the it, the situation was not in balance. Um, and the I, situation I, I, is now not in balance between a lot of companies and their workforce, and well, hence the need for for labor unions. Because as part of what happened was demonizing labor unions, and the number of employees represented by labor unions has significantly decreased. Yes. And when people are represented by unions, they have higher pay, better benefits. Oh, oh yeah, absolutely. Because and yeah. And companies will do almost anything to um avoid have, having unionized a unionized workforce. Well, we despite the UAW and and the Teamsters and very strong unions in our state of Michigan, we are a right to work state yeah legally yes um which, which means that you don't have to you a worker can benefit from the negotiations that the union does without having to contribute to the union at all right but it also but as as is the case in most other and I forgot to add my quotations for right to work state because yeah. there are others. The right to work is also the right to fire without cause and without reason yes. and without notice. Yes. So it's it, it 
it was sold as this this thing that hey you know just if you don't want to join a union and pay union dues that's wrong you shouldn't have to have to do that to get a job but but the legislation was really really about employers shouldn't have to, if you don't want to join the union what what they wanted was to allow people they wanted to be able to hire non-union people so that they yes. could fire them yes ah, sorry I, my i hurt my thumb the other day oh. and it, i forget sometimes and i snap my fingers oh, just yeah. that hurt. <laughs> um maybe you should because my, my good hands on my drink <laughs> yeah you should have another bourbon then um yeah so um i think that yeah the unions and companies there's certainly been ups and downs but i absolutely support the current union actions um because I, I, anticipation I, of future technology and understanding the absolute unbridled greed and disregard for people that some companies are driven by is the a driving force in in the what justice currently we have to seek if yeah if it if this becomes a I don't, I'm not sure what to call it. If this becomes a, a sandbag in the the war in placement of of bringing down executive pay so that the people who actually create things get more of of the a larger piece of the pie, a more just piece of the pie, if you will. Mm. I'm I'm for it. I think that they are. <clears throat> I think that fighting against history against technology is a is a losing game historically yeah but i don't think people uh, in the current climate i don't think people are fighting against technology they're just saying use it where it's useful but don't you know if somebody honestly if somebody makes the the movie that i was talking about entirely ai gener written generated produced film created um fine however most artificial intelligence is actually plagiarism software it has been trained on content that was created by people that it was fed into it without compensation for the people who created the original work that it's been trained yes. on you you're you're correct i don't think that's the case in the <clears throat> um in the instance of say facial mapping that's not what we're we're not talking about that kind of thing here the, right but the person should be get a royalty every time that's used so there's a that's i think i think that that's a worthwhile fight that actors yes. <clears throat> have to own and get residuals on their likeness yes in perpetuity yes and the you think about um there's a woman who whose genetic material was used to create cell lines that were used in research for decades hmm. and she got no compensation for that well sure. and that's a it's an interesting question yes I mean, well and it relates to the larger issue of bodily autonomy and well yeah <laughs> there's that you know it's a whole so, kind of a whole other question yeah. um, um people who I, yeah I'm 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 saying that I, I I am absolutely on board and support and encourage anything that that levels the playing field for the for the people who are artists and creators and people who are actually doing the work and the content from those who are just selling the content and and shuffling the money within the industry around 
Yes. Oh, like okay. health insurance companies. Just like health insurance. Absolutely yes. like and health insurance. Complete analogy, 100% analogy. They don't, I don't like referring to them as healthcare companies because they don't provide no. healthcare. They are, they move money around and take a big cut of it. Um, yeah, they are, they're healthcare lampreys is what they are. I mean, they're leeches. Yeah. Leeches. Yeah. They're, yeah. so I, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, yeah. So this is, that's why I'm saying, that's why I put it the way I did, because there's a larger question at stake here. Yes. And yeah. if, if the entertainment industry, which is a extremely, it's it's odd because the entertainment industry, while being incredibly lucrative, is a very narrow sort of canyon of of um, what I what I want to say participants, um, people in that industry is is very narrow and very but but kind of deep in a way. Yeah. So, but if it can be used as a model for other industries, I'm for it. You know, figure this out. And, you know, legislation has come out in the past that equalized labor and provided for better conditions and things like that. Um, it'd be a hard fight in our current climate, but it's been done in the past. Yep. And so I'm all for it. So if you are out there on the picket lines, know that we are absolutely supporting you and wish you the best of success in what you're doing because you're not just fighting for yourself you are fighting for all of us and a, and a future that i think we can't even exactly foresee right um so good on you for trying to you know fight the future fight yep the only picket line i will cross is a planned parenthood picket line so <laughs> oh yeah but that's not <laughs> yeah yeah that's, those, not a, that's that's not a, that's the wrong different kind of dispute that's a <laughs> protest line not a yeah yeah that's a yeah those people are um they're well they're wrong on the science well, and they're wrong on the uh, anyway that's another issue <laughs> um that's a, a a big issue that um we could tackle sometime we really Perhaps. want to get into something controversial. Yeah, that may be beyond the scope of our of our little of our little viewership here, but um, who knows? That maybe that could catapult us onto the national scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then we'd have to deal with all of that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think we could handle it. So I'm down with it. Yeah. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I I, I think when it's about fairness and justice, as you said, with the with the virtues, then we're we're obliged to take up the side of of justice. Yes. Um, and I think that the the unions in this case are absolutely on the side of justice. Yes. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Good so for I you guys. I think we have um, pretty well discussed that yeah okay i'm almost done with my drink so no oh, udia huh? see all right then I, I i now i get your motivation for wrapping up <laughs> <laughs> yeah there we go okay so uh like and share and uh comment please mm -hmm. let us know if you thought anything at all about this episode good or bad and if you're a member of a union um, and would like to come on and talk to us about this, uh, please let us know. We're happy to continue a discussion of this of this important oh, yeah. topic. Sure. So, so, yeah. In the meantime, between now and that time, yeah. be thou a good night and true. <laughs>